To build a city from scratch in the middle of the desert, a city that can house 50,000 people in a completely sustainable way. A city that recycles all of its waste and that runs totally on renewable energy. It's a gigantic experiment. For this dream to come true, the world's top scientists have been recruited. The alternative to provide the uh, power needed from the old UAE by burning diesel, I think this is a much better uh, solution. We've reduced the temperature that the body experiences by 20 degrees. It's staggering what you can do. No water, a scorching sun, fearsome sandstorms. If we can live ecologically in such an hostile environment, we can do it anywhere in the world. The name of this unique project, Mastar. Abu Dhabi, the largest of the seven United Arab Emirates. Bordered by the Persian Gulf to the north and the Rub al Khali Desert to the south. A country whose economy relies on oil, where energy is not a problem, where the need to save it doesn't enter the equation. Natural gas is available in abundance, making it possible, for example, to produce water and use it lavishly, or to air condition buildings around the clock. Back in the 1960s, Abu Dhabi looked like this. And then, oil exploration revealed vast reserves an ocean of crude oil. When we think of Abu Dhabi today, we think of this. Oil income has funded the most outlandish architectural projects. Yet it is in this country, ruled by black gold, that the idea of a city powered exclusively by renewable energy has seen the light of day. In the first decade of the 21st century, the price of oil remained high. But the Emirates saw into the future. They knew that the oil would someday run out. And indeed, the world's production of black gold has now peaked. Because it is a non-renewable energy source, they had to think to the future. So Abu Dhabi set itself an incredible challenge. Invest its petrodollars in a wild project build an entirely ecological city, a futuristic city housing 50,000 people in an area of 2.3 square miles, powered by renewable energy, have a zero carbon footprint, and be finished by 2025. Something purely sustainable, five times the size of London city in less than 15 years, an almost impossible task. The venue selected for Mazdar is some 10 miles from the capital of Abu Dhabi. The builders had to start from scratch in the middle of a burning desert because land on the coast was already taken. Mazdar in Arabic means spring or source, and above all, a source of knowledge, a student town with a university, a campus, businesses, parks, and housing. February 2008, the work starts. London architects, Foster and Partners, are in charge of designing the city. As soon as work begins, the first problem appears, building on sand. The foundations could shift, dangerously weakening the buildings. The answer, to sink concrete pillars to anchor the city. 
but construction is delayed by a first discovery. Digging down some three feet, the engineers find that the desert is riddled with layers of underground salt water, a veritable Swiss cheese. It's hypersaline, which means there's a lot of, it's a lot of salt in there, and that actually has a very negative effect on the concrete. It'll break it down. So not only is Mazdar's water not usable, but how could they ensure that the foundations wouldn't be eaten away? So here we have the concrete blocks that are... Um, uh, Different types of concrete were tested. The only one that stood the test was a mix of recycled metal waste, rendering the concrete less porous, so less likely to corrode. So as well as having a, a positive environmental impact, mm -hmm. it's also having a positive effect on, on the technical performance of the concrete as well. Very deep drilling was called for, to a depth of 65 feet. Then the anti-corrosive concrete was injected to create pillars and fix the city's foundations. For the city to be truly ecological, everything has to be recycled. The concrete and its components, the timber and metal too. Nick Brown is in charge of ensuring that each procedure on the worksite obeys rules of sustainable development. We're in the um, Materials Recycle Center, or the MRC that we call it, and one of the main objectives of, uh, of Mazda is to make sure that all the materials that we use, we make sure that they don't, they don't go, or as little as possible, will go, to, uh, will go to landfill. How do you interest people in the environment in a country where the law of market is all powerful? Mazdar is backing economic ecology, which means preserving natural resources while still turning a profit. Right, we actually have a lot of wood waste that, we are, that we've accumulated in the, in the, con in the construction phase. Uh, why do we not basically put these two together and say, let us use this wood waste that, we, that we've generated and create mulch, mulch from it. There's a business case for that as well, where you can then use this waste product to sell, um, you know, to sell to uh, golf courses or, you know, anybody, any sort of landscaped area, municipality, for example. This large machine crushes the timber into mulch. These are the big shavings that are spread at the base of plants so as to reduce water evaporation. When materials cannot be transformed directly, they can be reused as such, like the steel and metal used on the site. Traditionally, you know, throughout the world, there is a very, very uh, strong steel or metal um, scrap uh, market. And that is basically go to the steel recycle market and basically find the highest, the highest bidder. What we are giving is actually 100% re, uh, recycled steel. Steel is ecologically interesting because it can be recycled forever without losing its quality. In Mazdar, 100% of the steel employed has already been used elsewhere, whereas most other work sites in the world only use 40% recycled steel. A clever money-saving reuse. The actual definition of sustainability is, you know, the what we call the three the three P's. So that's people, planet, profit. And so, yes, you can um, make sure that your materials are 100% recycled. If they're not financially, um, uh, you know, cost effective, if they're if if they are way too expensive, then that in itself isn't sustainable. With people, you're looking at the social side of things, and so there has to be this balance where you say. You know, between the three, so, you know, people, planet, profit. Mazdar is proud of recycling or reallocating 96% of the waste generated by the construction. The sorting and recycling plant has been built 300 feet from the worksite, thus reducing movement. Less movement equals less diesel fuel used, equals lower CO2 emissions, equals more ecological construction.
early 2009, the work on the city's foundations has been underway for a year. Mazdar Science and Technology Institute was the first district to arise from the earth. Time was short and deadlines were tight. There was only one year left before the university's doors were to open in 2010. This 650 by 330 foot area will be a specialized training and research center for renewable energy practices. The rest of the city will be built around this intellectual core. Austin Relton is one of the architects sent into the field to think up the city. We've tried to develop an architectural language that is specific to Abu Dhabi that couldn't be anywhere else. And um, we've also tried to, obviously Mazda City is a carbon, carbon neutral, zero waste city. So that's obviously our kind of key driver. The main obstacles to reaching this goal were heat and wind. One hundred and thirty degrees Fahrenheit in midsummer. The air is stifling. They had to fight the Shamal, a northwesterly wind that blows at fifty miles per hour and makes working conditions difficult to unbearable. To fight the heat, the architects came up with the idea of looking to the past rather than to modern Abu Dhabi. If you go into downtown Abu Dhabi today, you'll see very generic international sky, uh, skyscrapers that just use air conditioning um, as kind of a default position. We started by trying to investigate how, how traditional Arabic settlements dealt with this quite harsh, um, harsh climate. First lesson, use the climate rather than fight it. Mazdar's designers placed the city across the path of the Shamal, so the air flowing from the north cools the city streets. To further accentuate the breeze effect, the buildings are placed on an open 23-foot high platform that allows the air to circulate. Another lesson taken from traditional cities, place the buildings close together to create shade, which is why Mazdar streets are barely 20 feet wide, even down to 13 feet for lanes. The heat also affects the speed of construction even more so when Ramadan falls in the month of August. Most of the laborers are Muslim and abide by an ironclad discipline, neither eating nor drinking a drop of water from sunup to sundown. 130 degrees Fahrenheit, exhausting work 12 hours a day. After the foundations were laid, the university walls rose, but the project fell behind schedule. To avoid the hottest times of day and make up for the delay, a second crew continued to work at night. September 2009 finally arrived and brought a bit of coolness. Work could resume flat out. The priority then became the campus residences. There was only a year left before the first students were to arrive, and the university was still a vast work site. The engineers had to find a material for the facades that would effectively insulate against the heat. But most of all, this material had to be found locally to limit environmental impact. What existed near Mazdar? Sand. 
we wanted to try and develop a local material so that the contractor would take the sand from all around us and he would fabricate these panels, which is a GRC. RVC, as in reinforced vitrified concrete, a blend of fiberglass and concrete, mostly composed of the sand that is plentiful in the Emirates. Another advantage of this material, in contrast to glass buildings, it doesn't get dirty easily. No need to clean it with lashings of water. The job was even more critical for the laboratories and study halls, for there would be several million dollars worth of equipment in the labs, and such cutting-edge tools demand stable temperatures. But air conditioning and electric lighting guzzle energy and have to be avoided as much as possible. The solution was found not through insulation, but by layering, with these round chips in the walls. It's a plastic sheath with a layer of air and reflectors underneath. When the sun passes through the first two layers, it bounces off the reflectors, keeping the heat from entering the building. When reflecting back out through the chip-dotted plastic, the sunlight is diffused so that the light reaches the street, but the heat doesn't. Although the sun is a terrible constraint for Mazdar's designers, it is also a powerful source of energy a vital bonus in making the city work. How can enough electricity be produced to enable 50,000 people to live comfortably? 50,000 people needing transportation, lighting, air conditioning and hot water. On such a scale, the challenge is immense. Every roof of the Mazdar Institute is covered with solar panels, but that's only enough to meet a third of the demands in electricity. A much greater scale had to be found to supply the entire university. A 54-acre photovoltaic power station that can produce up to 10 megawatts of electricity at full bore. Professor Afshin Afshari, head of the Masdar Energy Department, supervises the work, his specialty being to increase the effectiveness of renewable energy sources. In this region, we have about six, sometimes seven hours per day of full sun energy. Uh, this is uh, about 50% in average, more than what you would have in Europe, for instance. Whatever extra electricity is produced is sent to the grid, to the Abu Dhabi grid. We are exporting uh, at some periods of time. As it has one of the world's greatest number of sunny days per year, the sun provides Abu Dhabi with a clean and infinitely renewable energy source. But a problem remains, an element that impedes the proper functioning of solar panels, sand. Well, the panels have to be washed anyway, uh, about uh, you know, once every two weeks in this case. Uh, but, of course, when there is a sandstorm, you have an immediate impact because uh, you have an immediate drop in the output, and then afterwards you have to clean, yes. Removing the sand with brushes isn't enough. The only option would be to wash them with water but it is work intensive and not very ecological. Mazdar researchers will be faced with one of their greatest challenges in the coming years. They will need to turn to nanotechnologies to find new non-stick materials to prevent sand buildup. The first Mazdar neighborhood is supplied by this huge solar farm. But with the city expanding, another gigantic sustainable power station is being developed a few miles away, 
out in the desert. Winter 2009. The facades have been erected. The building's insulation works. Now, the next challenge has to be met. How can the courtyards and streets be cooled naturally? The city has to be pedestrian friendly even in summer. Environmental solutions are often local. Here again, the Mazdar architects turn to a concept that has always been used in the Arabian Peninsula. Wind towers. Close to 150 feet high, a recycled steel skeleton. One of the tallest wind towers ever built. The wind tower is a very, very common, common design uh, feature in, in, in traditional Arabic structures. Maybe not used on this level, typically used to ventilate a courtyard in a domestic dwelling. Assembled in six months, the tower became the university's highest point, Mazdar's landmark. It's really, really simple. We've, uh, the wind tower is a triangle on plan. We've got a weather station at the top, so the weather station tells us where the wind's coming from. Is it warm? Is it humid? How, how, uh, how strong is it? Is it full of dust? All, all of this information. That, that then determines which side of the louvers at the top will open. So basically, one side opens, the air comes in, the two others are closed, it's pushed down the sock in the middle, and the wind comes out the bottom. It's, you know, it's really, really simple. As well as blowing air into the city center, a clever cooling system was also installed. At the top, we've got a ring of misters, so we can, we can mist cool air in there to so get evap um, evaporative cooling, which in traditional wind towers, um, uh, the Arabic ladies used to hang their wet washing at the top of the wind tower. So we've done the same thing again. By both spraying and fanning, the wind tower casts humid air over the town center. As they evaporate, the tiny water droplets absorb the air's caloric energy and cool it off. Mazdar was supposed to build its own sustainable water conversion plant, but the world economic crisis hit the Emirates in early 2010 and dealt the green city a nasty blow. The construction budget for the city was reduced by 15%, lowering it to $18 billion. Because of this, the plans to produce water had to be shelved. Office buildings, housing, retail outlets, the building of other neighborhoods was postponed. So all efforts were focused on the university. September 2010, the big day arrives. Over 72,000 square feet, some 100 apartments, four laboratories and a library, the buildings were ready on time. The first 250 students arrive. Only 20% of Mazdar students were born in the United Arab Emirates. The others come from the world over, 37 different countries. Diala is from Lebanon and is majoring in sustainable technology communication. She admits to having been a little disorientated at first. You feel like you're being a guinea pig for a trial because everything is not really, the system is not really there yet, you know. It's uh, still trial and error. So what happens is we report the difficulties we live in every while so that they can, you know, refit it. To save energy, natural lighting is used in the laboratories. The trick is to bring daylight into rooms without letting in the heat. So if we turn around and we look at the lab facade here, we were talking about keeping the sunlight off the glass. First of all, we've limited the amount of glass. One of the rules of the master plan is uh, you can't have more than 30% of any facade 
glazed. So we, the glass is strategically positioned within here. So the, 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 the kind of double bay you see at the bottom here is where the scientists would sit down and stand up. So when they look out, they see, they see outside. And the, and, the, and the bay at the top is to let light come in and bounce off the ceiling and illuminate the space, provide a general level of light uh, within the space. But if you look at the, the louvers, what we've done is we've analysed every single facade of the building here with quite sophisticated software. So we know, we know where and when the, su the sunlight hits it. And so that's determined the exact spacing, size and number of all of these louvers. So every facade is different. first appearance, it looks like it's not finished. Oh, well, we've put some louvers on the glass, some of the vertical louvers, but we've missed an area. That area never gets direct sunlight. We know that's always in the shade, so we don't need to use materials. Mechanical engineering, materials information technology, Brains are recruited for Mazdar starting at the master's level. Some teachers, like young Dr. Matteo Chiesa, have studied at prestigious schools like MIT in the United States, one of the world's top technological institutes. But usually, you students should be cleaning the blackboard, but that's, uh, they are too busy in uh, creating science, so that's the reason why I have to do this kind of stuff. <laughs> I have uh, a class which is much smaller than a usual class elsewhere. So it, it's the same style that uh, you would find at MIT or you find uh, elsewhere. Matteo and his students are developing their own solar thermal plant, located 650 feet from the campus. Only about 10 exist in the world. This particular plant is still experimental. In contrast to photovoltaic panels, its energy source is not light, but the sun's heat. An helios, that is a moving mirror. Helios is a Greek word for the sun. Stat is because uh, it's been uh, fast, it's not moving. Compared to the mirror up there, uh, the sun is always in the same position. So I'm moving my uh, mirror on the ground in order to have the sun always uh, heating to uh, the target up there. The sun's rays strike the target reflectors and are then beamed one by one downwards, focusing on this white surface. The temperature that uh, you have uh, is around 500 degrees C. So it's nothing big. It's a very small planet, it's just 100 kilowatts. It is barely enough energy to power a dozen houses, certainly not enough for a city like Mazdar. Underneath this white porcelain square, there is an oil-filled pipe system. The oil stores the sun's heat, and its temperature rises to 930 degrees Fahrenheit. It then heats water, which is gradually turned into steam, which in turn serves to drive a turbine, which in the end produces electricity. The plant's concept is revolutionary. In contrast to photovoltaic panels, it enables the storage of energy without using polluting batteries. The plant can produce electricity even when the sun is down. With this kind of installation, the Emirates is getting a jump on the end of oil. It's uh, there are two main reasons. One, maintaining the position as an energy provider, and the second, to, uh, increase, uh, to increase the education to go from a simply uh, exporter of raw material to uh, a more uh, knowledge-based economy. This is how the Emirates is hoping to shed its image as an oil power and turn to ecology, a revolution to which the Mazdar students want to contribute. And the whole Middle East, you know, especially the GCC country, is one of the highest uh, emitters of CO2. So it's very nice and it's very interesting to see that somebody is actually doing something about it and you want to be a part of that. Mm. campus is growing. A year later, 100 more students enroll. 
Mohammed comes from Sharjah, one of the smallest of the United Arab Emirates. He remembers how surprised he was when he arrived in Mazdar. I thought that I'll, not, I'll never continue in this institute. <laughs> it was really difficult, you know. Um, in this part of the world, people are not used to the uh, ideas of recycling, living a sustainable life, let's say. That's why it was a shocking experience at the, uh, at the first. But today, Mohammed has perfectly assimilated the principles of the city's sustainability, as demonstrated by a visit to his room. Five hundred and forty square feet for Mohammed alone, or five times larger than an average student's room at a European university. Even the windows, they are designed in a way that it captures the uh, the light, but not the heat. So the light is coming in from this window. That's why you can see the windows in different directions. As with the laboratories, each dorm is different depending upon how much sun it gets. But their point in common is to avoid wasting energy used for air conditioning. That has been restricted. The AC uh, controller, you cannot uh, control it. So they are fixing the uh, temperature to 24 or 23 to 24. All of that may seem a bit insignificant, but such small victories help to raise student awareness. A column out in the middle of the courtyard shows the energy consumed by the whole institute. The winter, I want to show you the water consumption, uh, water efficiency. Now we are consuming at this hour, uh, 11 o'clock, 1,820 liters of water. From, let's say, 3 p.m., uh, for 3 a.m. to 8 a.m., the consumption was too low. Everyone was, was sleeping. The United Arab Emirates is one of the world's biggest consumers of water, with 121 gallons per head per day. The average in Britain is 39 gallons. Mazdar aims to reduce this consumption to 23 gallons per head per day. To reach this goal, the entire institute is monitored. Each student's usage is analyzed and the energy accounted for. Water and electricity consumption, temperatures, breakdowns, leaks, all this information converges to the campus's basement the city's nerve center. This is the domain of Martin Potter, NASDAR's technical manager. He is responsible for enforcing the principles of sustainability on the campus. The data gathered by thousands of sensors located around the city are analyzed in this control room. we can actually measure down to one kilowatt per hour and we can differentiate between each and every residential apartment on campus. So if I have, if I, if I put all the information together on a graph, I can go and knock on somebody's door if I choose to and say, you are the biggest power consumer on campus. And you can't deny the figures because we know the figures coming out of the system are accurate. Facts are facts. So it's not, it's not like, we're assuming that you've left your lights on. We can see if you've left your lights on. Martin Potter needs to know everything about the residents' habits in order to improve the city's energy efficiency. Students have saddled him with a nickname. The green policeman, yeah. I'm kind of big brother, but at the end of the day, we're all here to prove that sustainability does work and that sustainability doesn't have to impose on your daily life. It should just become what you do normally. It's not been easy sailing. Um, we've had students complaining that their air conditioning doesn't turn down below 22 degrees. Some of them do resent being watched, but we're not, we don't impose problems on them. We just let them do what they do, and then we take the results back and we re-educate them, and it's up to them if they want to accept. The city's designers have found sly ways of warning students when they consume too much energy without having to constantly call them to order. The city's landmark, the wind tower, lights up every evening at dusk. 
When it is blue, Mazdar's residents can go about their business as usual. When it turns red, the consumption level is too high. So showers have to be postponed and useless lights have to be turned off. Early 2012, two years after the Mazdar Institute opened, the Austin Relton team tried to gauge the architecture's impact on the pedestrian environment in real terms. To find a model to compare it, we went down to downtown Abu Dhabi, to your typical street, 60 meters wide. Because of the urban design in downtown Abu Dhabi, a day when the air temperature is 39, it makes you experience a temperature of 52. So on the same day, we then came to Mazda City. 39 degrees air temperature again, but the radiant temperature now, we've managed to lower to 37. So instead of being 50, we've, we've reduced the temperature that the body experiences by 20 degrees. It's staggering what you can do. Staggering, but still not perfect. After two years of operations, Mazdar is not yet self-sufficient in water production. Take these fountains, for example. They cool off the atmosphere, but the constantly flowing water is not recycled. Water is, is one, of, one of the challenges that uh, we are not directly addressing. For now, this water is produced by desalinating seawater, a process consuming natural gas and a source of pollution. The heat generated by the gas power plant is recycled to boil the seawater. The steam produced is condensed, producing fresh water. The salt and water residue is emptied into the sea as high-density brine. The system is ingenious, as it produces both energy and drinking water. Using natural gas, however, doesn't quite square with the city's ecological ambitions. Fortunately, Mazdar's engineers are working on a new technique that will make the operation clean, reverse osmosis. So that's the future of uh, uh, sustainable desalination, I would say. It's a combination of photovoltaic panels and reverse osmosis desalination. Reverse osmosis uses a filtering membrane to extract fresh water from salt water. To do so, seawater has to be injected at high pressure into the membrane. What is new is that the pump pressurizing the water can be powered by solar energy. This technique will have to be adapted on a large scale to enable water production in Mazdar without burning gas. Spring 2012, the project enters a decisive new phase. The city is growing. The institute will have to double in size within a year. An international energy group is starting to build its 270,000 square foot headquarters that will house 2,000 new employees by the summer of 2013. And six months later, the International Renewable Energy Agency will move in only 300 feet from the university. By 2025, the city will cover over 2.3 square miles, so the issue of transportation will have to be tackled. Public transportation, unthinkable in a country where private cars reign supreme. It is also a touchy subject to have women, even veiled, share the same passenger compartment as men. Electric pod cars are being tested on the campus. They are practical and ecological, but there are too many students and the city has been designed for pedestrians as a priority. 
so a one-of-a-kind transportation system has been designed especially for Mazdar. The PRT, Personal Rapid Transit, futuristic self-steering pod cars. To test them, a short section of road was built under the university. Two stations, 1.2 miles apart, are being tried out. In the future, the system could be extended as the city grows. It runs around about 40 k's an hour. It is pretty quick, yeah. The system works automatically. It works out distance between cars. Um, as you can see, it's going to park itself now. All the cars are left outside the boundary of the city. So other than deliveries at the moment, which will stop eventually, there are no fossil fuel vehicles um, allowed on the campus. The city gates are designed like ecological airlocks. Polluting cars must be left by their owners in the parking lots, where they transfer to a PRT. We become pretty blasé about it all. You know, you, you hop on a car whenever you need to. When you bring visitors, they're, oh, it's fantastic. How good's this? Like, OK, yeah, it is good. We just use it. The first route to be built leads to the campus center. If the city lives up to expectations, there will be a station in each Mazdar neighborhood. Jap Dweezer, the designer of these unique cars, works in the city's entrails at the PRT Repair and Cleaning Center. In the floor, we have magnets every two meters. Underneath the PRT is a magnet router that sends the magnets and the PET has a layout from the whole track, also a database with the magnets, and combined with a gyro and the wheel encoders counting the turning of the wheels, that's how we navigate. Like everything else electric in the city, the PRTs run on solar energy. In this room and in every station, we have a charge pad. As soon as a PET arrived, the charge pad is going up, and we have two contacts underneath the PET, and through that, we will charge the battery, if necessary. The PRT batteries provide five hours of autonomy, but they are partially recharged at every stop at a station, enough for the PRT fleet to work continuously. Safety remains the top priority for Jap and his crew. So he see me already, uh, already from a longer distance. So you can see it slowing down already. And on approximately two meters, it will stand still. And if I walk away, he will follow me like a dog. And I stand still again, and it will stop again. Underneath the PT, just in front of it, we find the laser sensor. That is uh, the main safety that we're using. Uh, if it fails, it never fails. Then before we hit anything, we have also switches in the bumper. So as soon as this we switch, it will stop also. PRTs are loaded with ultra-modern sensors. A magnetic detector beneath the vehicles identify the magnets in the ground, and the front and rear lasers detect obstacles. Mazdar needs energy if it is to grow quickly. Early 2012, a colossal complex emerges from the dunes of Rab al Khali, 75 miles from Abu Dhabi. 250,000 reflecting dishes. On 1,100 acres, or some 850 football fields, Sham Swan, one of the world's largest solar concentration power plants. It is the first time that a city the size of Mazdar will use a solar energy production unit of this size. The plant will be inaugurated in 2013 and should cover all of the green city's energy needs and even export surplus electricity to Abu Dhabi. A new experimental field for Professor Matteo. 
you have a big parabola where you have uh, uh, the sun in the middle of the sky that moves during the day. Well, it's not the sun moving, but uh, well, we know about it. Uh, the radiation or the solar rays comes to this uh, parabola, this big mirror, and gets reflected back with the same angle to a certain uh, pipe where a working fluid, in this case oil, is heating up. SHAMS-1 is one of a kind, a hybrid power plant powered by sun and gas. The gas increases the power plant's yield and takes over when there's a lack of sun. Inevitably, in a country like the Emirates, where on summer nights all of the air conditioners are working full blast, reaching maximum consumption. We need to uh, get this uh, heat in the walking fluid in the oil into steam. So we have the heat exchanger, and this is the, the stuff that you see inside here. These pipes carry the reflector heated oil to the power station. The heat boils the water that rises gradually to 750 degrees Fahrenheit and turns to steam. To reach the required power, the engineers added a booster, an enormous gas burner that raises the steam temperature to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. A very hot steam then drives the giant turbine linked to a generator. As in the Emirates, the power station has to work at full capacity even at night. Once the sun is down, secondary gas burners kick in to heat the steam. Sustainability or whatever would tell you you should uh, just use uh, solar radiation. But on the other hand, uh, when uh, the alternative, for example, to meet or, or, or provide the uh, power needed from the old UAE by burning diesel, I think this is a much better uh, solution. At full capacity, SHAMS-1 will supply 100 megawatts of power enough to supply 10 to 20,000 homes. This power plant is a mirror image of Mazdar, a crucial first step towards sustainable development. For a country like the United Arab Emirates with its oil-based economy, where ecology and sustainability are new ideas, the Mazdar project is a genuine revolution. Despite the world economic crisis, the government has maintained the initial budget of 18 billion euros, but project completion has been pushed back from 2025 to 2030. Apartment construction has begun, and the first renters curious to take part in the Green City experiment will begin moving in in late 2013. Mazdar is a test city. It offers technological innovations for all countries of the world. A visionary endeavor a new way of contemplating the future when we will all have to learn to live without oil. <laughs>